Hi, everybody. It's Ann Patchett. And before I put on my hat as a writer, I am going to have a moment in which I am still a bookseller. And I am so grateful for everyone coming out tonight to watch this event. We are showing it at a bunch of different stores. And I just want to give a shout out to all the stores who are involved. Novel Neighbor, Watermark Books, McLean and Eakin, Changing Hands, Square Books, Boswell's Book Company, Anderson's Bookshop, Left Bank Books, Pegasus Books, and oh yeah, by the way, Parnassus Books. I really and truly, I, I read those names and I think about all my friends at all of those stores. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, I know that all of these stores had the same experience that we had at Parnassus Books, which is during the pandemic, our customers came out for, uh, for us with so much love and so much support. And I just want to urge you that if you decide to buy more books tonight, buy them from your independent bookstore. If by some crazy chance you haven't read America's Best Selling Book, The Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls, buy it at your local independent bookstores because that's how we all stay in business. This is going to be such a great conversation with my friend Amor Tolls. Thanks for watching. Amor Tolls, hi. Thank you so much for doing this and for being here. Where are you? Ann Patchett, it is my pleasure. I can't believe it. I, I can't, it's very exciting to be here. I'm in New York City in my in my uh, at my writing desk in my office in Manhattan. I've, uh, I've seen that. I've seen that writing desk. I've seen that office in Manhattan. That's right. That's right. Um, for those of you who are watching, and boy, aren't we glad that you are. Amor and I are friends, and we talk a lot, and we Zoom a lot. That's the interesting thing about our friendship. We don't talk on the phone. We don't much email. We Zoom. And I, I think I like it more than Anne does. So I think there's no, some. Kind of... I, it's just you. Like you're the you're my only non-professional Zoom. I think so I feel yeah. super comfortable doing this with sometimes you. Sometimes Anne's like, can he just call or can he? Just, you know? <laughs> no, good to see you. But, but the the pleasure is I do I feel like one I feel like at least once I did we had like a FaceTime where I think you might have been on the treadmill or some version of that. <laughs> that's part of the, yeah. that's part of the pleasure of of, of, being, of being able to do this kind of thing. That added and, a whole dimension to my experience of Ann Patchett. Right. And also, um, when, let's see if I can lift it. When Amor's fabulous book, The Lincoln Highway, came out, I interviewed him. And the deal was we would do a little quid pro quo. You would interview me. I would interview you. So this this is nice. Like, I, you're the one person that I... I feel like, oh, I'm not asking him this huge favor because, you know, basically I did the huge favor for you. We're yeah. totally square. It feels I totally, good. I totally owe you. <laughs> That's right. Well, Ann Patchett, it's very exciting to be here as a part of, wait, there you go, the launch or the, of, the, of these precious days. And I'm going to go right into with questions. Okay. So I, I'd like to start. Uh, and I, I hope this is all right. I'd actually like to start before we get into the book to, for my benefit, for the benefit of listeners is what is the Ann Patchett typical day? You know, because, because between the, you know, the writing of fiction, the writing of essays, your dog, Carl, the bookstore, your general ambassadorship through, you know, writing and book selling around the country. What is it? What are the what? How do you manage all that? What is it? What does it look like in terms of a typical day? And part of the reason I ask this is I think people are always interested in that, but also these precious days gives us glimpses of your life from different angles at different times. So just right. to sort of give us a little bit of a backdrop would be would be great. Um, there is no such thing. I, I think that you are a much more um, regular writer than I am. I I get plenty written. But it, I'm not a person who writes every day. I certainly am not a person who writes anywhere near having a book coming out. Um, I'm, I'm always amazed. Well, like you, I mean, you really managed to get to your desk 
no matter how bad things are. I think if you were on the Titanic and it was going down, you would still map out a good quiet 45 minutes to work on your novel, whereas I would be going straight for the lifeboats. Um, so different times are very different. This time with the book launch is just incredibly busy and I spend a lot of time Zooming with people I don't know in Australia uh, to talk about the publication of the book, but then factor in that Parnassus is having its 10th anniversary right now in November. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So that's taken up a lot of time. I'm interviewing a lot of authors this fall. Are you are you doing that? Is it just me or are you interviewing a ton of people? I, I do I try to do more. I've done a little bit, but I try to do more of it when I'm off cycle. Yeah. When I'm on cycle. Do you know what I mean? So because I know what you mean. Yeah. But when you're on a bookstore. Yes. You're always on cycle. cycle. Right. Um, reading is a huge part of it. Like home life is a huge part of it. Carl is a doctor who still goes to work every day. So even as I'm incredibly busy, I'm still the one cleaning the house and making dinner and um, paying the bills. So it's, I want a wife. That's what I want. <laughs> we'll I want work on that. Really. Yeah. And, and in a normal writing environment. So let's say when you were working on this, or an essay is a little different, I suppose, versus a novel. But what does it look like? What is your pattern of behavior when you are in a, uh, a project? I am a morning person. Um, I wake up at my very best and I steadily go downhill all day. Uh, when I'm first starting, let's say it's a novel because I have a novel that I will be writing as soon as this is done. Um, at the beginning, I can stay at my desk for maybe 20 minutes a day. Uh, it's, it's really like sitting on the burner of a stove. Uh, and then by the time I get to the end of a novel, I can stay at my desk working for 12 or 14 hours a day. Uh, it's it, it depends entirely on where I'm at in the cycle. And then I do try my very best to block things out and be a little less helpful in the world and a little less helpful in the bookstore. It, it's interesting because I'm a lot more likely to, to be a good citizen when I'm crazy and out in the world anyway. That's when I would rather interview people than when I am writing because I do so much prep and it's, you know, it kind of comes back to the same thing. It's impossible to say, because to me, the whole pleasure of being a writer is the fact that I don't keep too much of a schedule, but you had a grown up job for such yeah. a long time. And I think that that probably hardwired your brain in a different way. Right. Like no, that, work. That's true. It probably ma makes me a little bit more inclined to sort of organize my time in a, in a, in a, in a written agenda, you know, for better or worse. Um, so, so in, in talking about uh, your new collection of essays, um, these essays span a lot uh, in a great way, right? They, they deal with, uh, with, with beginning of life and end of life. With, uh, they provide a window on your friendships, your family, uh, your, your life as a writer, your domestic life that you just mentioned, your relationship to Carl. Um, it, it, they, they, they encompass a great deal. And uh, in a, in, as I say, in a wonderful way. And before we get into the essays themselves and, and this particular collection, I, for those who don't know your history with essay writing, I'd love it if you just give them a quick glimpse, which you wrote about in the introduction of your last book of essays. So yes. You've read that they know it. But, but for some, it may still come, you know, those who came, who discovered you with Commonwealth, who discovered you with the Dutch House and are working their way backwards through your fiction, uh, may not have as much of a sense of how long and how, you've been writing essays and how important it was kind of to the evolution of you as a professional writer. Uh, yes. I was, I was wondering if you could just sort of give people a glimpse of that. Yeah, absolutely. So the job that I had, I, I really think is almost not available anymore. Mm -hmm. I taught a little bit when I was young. Uh, I would, you know, do a guest year, a guest semester. And, and, Teaching just took up every single second of my life. And I knew that that wasn't how I wanted to support myself. And so I decided that I would support myself as a magazine writer, a newspaper writer, freelance. And when I was in my 20s, 30s, you could really do that. There were so many magazines out there. I started writing for 17 when I was I don't know, like 22. 
uh, and wrote for a lot of bad magazines, wrote for Bridal Guide, uh, wrote for all the the fashions, you know, the, the glamour mademoiselle then, you know, was elevated up to Vogue um, and GQ. Uh, but the way it works is either you have a friend you went to college with who gets a job at one of those magazines and hires you. And then that friend gets a job at another magazine. And so it, it's sort of like cell division. Uh, you can keep writing for the last magazine, but then that editor will also take you to the next magazine. So working my way up from bad magazines to being a regular writer at the New York Times, uh, writing for the Atlantic, writing for Harper's, uh, writing for the New Yorker, it actually had a lot to do with my editors getting promoted and taking me along. Right. And that's just, I mean, that's how I paid the bills for a long time while I was also writing fiction. And I always had a sense that fiction was my real job and nonfiction was money. And I think that that was a lot more true in my first collection, This is a Story of a Happy Marriage. These are essays mostly that I wrote for myself. Right, and then that comes across. And I guess what that history of writing essays, as you know, kind of as you were coming up as a, as a, as a novelist at the same time, you've, you've, you've suggested that that benefited you to some degree as a writer of fiction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and can you, can you explain that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because it just, it made me such a worker. So as much as I'll say, oh, I don't keep to a regular schedule, I publish a lot of books. I mean, I, I may not keep to a regular schedule, but I get my work done. And the, the way I kind of made my name in journalism and nonfiction was that I was the person who never missed a deadline who always turned my homework in early. Um, it, I have a lot of stories about uh, an editor will call and say, the person who was supposed to hand this piece in today just said that they haven't even started it. We're closing the magazine at five o'clock. Can you write something? Perfect. Yes. yes. No, the answer is the universal yes. yes. I am your go-to person. And that did really help me in fiction. It, it made, nonfiction made me not be precious. Right in my fiction yeah, because I, in, in nonfiction you have a thousand words and then an ad gets cut and your editor calls and says oh wait it's down to 600 words because we've lost the ad space you've got 20 minutes to cut 400 words you know i'll talk to you in 20 minutes right i got really good at that saying what i wanted to say in fewer words and, and being less concerned about protecting every last sentence right because you sort of you, you, right. you, you have to kind of learn that not all the sentences are going to survive. And so right. It, 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 in both cases, it seems to take away, uh, in, a, in a productive sense, some of the romanticism that we kind of perhaps grow up with as in, the imag in our imaginations. You and I both wanted to write fiction when we were very young, and you know, but you have this sort of romantic vision, whether it's you know sitting in a cafe in Paris or whatever, you know. But right. Like, right. Uh, and, and thinking, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just sort of wander around like a romantic poet and think in the woods, you know. <laughs> And that'll be, you know, that'll be the source of all this fabulous writing. But uh, shedding some of that romance and sort of rethinking it and retooling it towards, to some degree, a profession, you know, I think is 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 productive, even from a creative standpoint. I I think that's absolutely true. I've always been obsessed with word counts in nonfiction. You know, it, is this is this eight hundred words? Is this eight thousand words? The worst thing is an editor who will say, oh, write it however you want, and then we'll edit it down. No, it's like a track and field event. I mean, yeah. different lengths really mean different things. Of course. But especially in writing op-eds where you have usually eight to 1,200 words, how can you say something pretty complicated in that amount of space? It made me so aware of the reader's time. Yeah. And that's the thing that I, that obsession I really brought that back to fiction. Also writing children's books. I've written several picture books and well, I've published two, but I've written a ton of them and more will be coming. <laughs> okay. uh, but you know, then you're really tied on words. How can you tell a whole story in fewer words? And you go back and back and pull words out, comb them out. How can I say this more succinctly? But a lot of times what we don't realize as novelists, when you say something more succinctly, you're actually saying it better. Yes, yes. And, and of course, the sonnet 
is the sonnet. The sonnet right? has a syllable count. That's the whole point. It has a syllable count instead of a word right. count. And, and, and you have to work within that framework. And that's part of the pleasure. The reason the sonnet keeps getting done is, is having some limitations setting around the creative project can be productive. I so agree. And one of my very favorite things to do, especially with my sister, but I will also do this alone, is, you know, if my sister and I are sitting in a restaurant waiting for our food, we will write a sestina. <laughs> you know, we'll just start counting out the syllables, figuring out the end words. That's, you know, that's why I don't have a cell phone because that, it leaves me more time to write sestinas. That is so terrifically nerdy. And by the way, listeners at home, this that was worth the whole visit. That, that <laughs> little, <laughs> image, image of Anne and her sister writing sestinas while they're waiting for, you know, the vegetarian lasagna or what have That's you. right. A good villanelle, a good villanelle can fill the time like nothing else. Okay, so one of the things that, that's very interesting for me as someone, a reader of yours, and, uh, and and someone who read you before I got to know you, and is and, and for me, who, who I don't, I'm not a big essay writer. I've done some, but it's really, you know, I haven't done a lot, is the difference between the personal and the imagined. And, and you know, you have said to me that, that I think really until Commonwealth, the personal was not, the very personal, was not your go-to subject matter as a writer. As a fiction writer. As a fiction writer, right. Fiction writer. But clearly there was in your essay writing, so this evolution, I, I, I sort of imagine it's an evolution because it seems like you started out in that great sort of, uh, you know, 1970s, 60s style of, we're sending Anne to jump out of a plane in a parachute. I'm making that one up. But, but, no, right, but it wasn't <laughs> like that. Wow. You know, and so, so you are a subject in the story, but the story isn't necessarily really about you. But it seems that over time, your essays have increasingly uh, in, a, in a wonderful way, sort of, you, you, you've had the generosity of, of bringing us into your life a little bit more. And I think you even say in the introduction, I may have roamed in my fiction, but this work tends to reflect a life lived close to home. Yes. And there is that feeling. So can you, can you talk about that? Like as a writer, not only the shift or the, whether the, the attraction to it, what, what is the difference in, in the process? What is the difference in the satisfaction? What is the difference in the game, in the, in the goal? moving from that imagined to turning your lens on, on your personal life? I think that it, it's not a problem turning my lens on my personal life because my personal life is pretty darn tame. Uh, and so I'm not getting into, you know, tricky territory hardly at all. Uh, the difference between fiction and nonfiction for me is that fiction is hard and nonfiction is just so much easier. And uh, it's easier because when something happens and I can identify it as, well, this is something I'd wanna write an essay about. I know who the characters are. I know what the setting is. I know what the arc of the story is. I know when it begins and when it ends. All of the questions I struggle with in fiction are presented to me in nonfiction. All I really have to do in nonfiction is write well. And at this point, I, I know how to do that. Also, there is such a pleasure when you're somebody who writes big, long books in writing something that you can kind of hold the whole thing in your mind. You could sit down in several days and knock out a draft. You are a great short story writer, which I never write short stories. But I think that it's got to be a similar sort of thing. And I wrote short stories when I was young. Um, it's almost like sending up a flare to the world to say I'm still alive because you're so missing in the middle of a novel. You've gone so subterranean. And sometimes to step out of that river and just make something lovely, right? Like a yeah. short story or an essay. Yeah. Don't you feel that way about your stories? We've talked a little bit about this too. When, when, uh, when a book comes out, for in fiction or nonfiction, for those of you who are watching, there, it generally clutters in a great, if you're lucky, it clutters up your calendar for a period of time because you're speaking about the book or you're, you're being interviewed about the book or you're hoping to speak about the book. Right, right. You're, tra you're potentially traveling. And, and, and like, for instance, for me, that is a very difficult time in which to write a novel. I can't do it, you know, because I need that, that sort of very clear runway and, and limited input uh, uh, 
while I'm thinking about a novel, but I can write short stories or, or you know, essays in that in, in those kinds of modes. So it is nice to have a, a something that you can write in a shorter period of time. Yeah, yeah. It and um, it's it's just a different set of muscles yeah. in a way. You know, it's the it's the difference between a sprint and a marathon. Now you you, you said a second ago. And I, I, I totally get your reasoning. You know, you, as you say, you don't have to invent the setting. You don't have to invent the characters. You just have to figure out the writing. You kind of put it like that. What, what you're leaving out there is is two very important components. I mean, that's a, that's an important one, clearly. But is 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 you still have to observe well. And you know, ideally, you may you you want to have some insights, right? And uh, and and that is clearly a part of your essays. The aspect of this very beautiful aspect of them is that they are very closely observed in a very in a way that is is, is a, in, has kinship with your fiction writing you know when we walk into a house or into the room and what you see to kind of lay out what we've stepped into uh to me is 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 it rhymes with what you're doing in your fiction in a great way sure sure and the and the, the human insights that you have over the course of the essays are also a feature of your fiction but but they, but they kind of you kind of come across those those insights in a different pattern. Okay, but that's not that's not about writing. That's mm -hmm. about being alive. You know, that's about okay. just I am who I am. My yeah. insights. It's not like I'm. It's not like I'm saying okay, I'm going to write an essay, and now I want to really observe and have mm -hmm. insight. That mm -hmm. is how I see the world. Yeah. I had an experience with a neighbor. Um, so when my friend Suki Raphael lived with us during the pandemic, all my neighbors got to know her. And then she went home to Los Angeles. I went out to Los Angeles at the end of her life. Suki died. I came back home. Every morning I take the dog out for a walk. And, and there are interestingly only men in the morning, like all the wives are home in bed and all the husbands are taking their dogs out for the first walk of morning, except me, uh, Sparky and I, Sparky and I are out. And so they're all of the, like the neighborhood husbands that I'm talking to in the morning. And across the street, there's an oncologist, Michael, who great, great guy, nice Labrador retriever. And we're talking about Suki and, and he was, he was so helpful. He gave me a lot of great insights. Then about a week later, I see Michael and he's read the essay, These Precious Days. It, it just coincidentally showed up in his newsfeed and he read it and, and, you know, somebody I've known for years in that, I see you in the morning walking the dog kind of way. And he says to me, how, how did you do that? He was kind of horrified. He's like, how did you make yourself so vulnerable? How did you dig so deep into the truth? How, how could you bring yourself to say those things? And I said, you know, Michael, that doesn't have anything to do with writing. That's just who I am. Okay. That's how I see the world. That's how I talk. That's how I relate to my friends. Um, I'm I'm not ever thinking, oh, I'm going to write an essay, so I'm going to really push it now. I'm going to really go there. It's like it, in this head, it's like that all the time. Do you have, I mean, I, I find that some of the discoveries or insights in my fiction, which people, which resonate with readers i would never have had in the course of my normal life it is only through writing that work of fiction that those insights came to the surface with me yes do you find that in terms of writing these essays when you know do those some of those poetic sort of sharp moments where sort of a, a, a notion of, of, of life sort of presents itself does that come out of the writing process itself or do you yeah. are you having those all day long Anne? <laughs> well you know the thing is it's like having a serious meditation practice or being in psychoanalysis um, or trying to solve a really difficult algebraic proof. Uh, you are sitting and thinking deeply and completely being with something. So I'm always capable, but of course we get really busy and overwhelmed and we skate over the surface because we have to in order to survive. So with fiction or with nonfiction, what you're doing is stopping and allowing yourself to be who you are by thinking deeply about either your own life, the real life that's going on, or 
the fictional world in which you are creating characters. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well put. Okay. So let me, can I just tell you something that happened yeah. day before yesterday? Yeah. So um, Carl flew me around for two days. We went to Alabama and several places in Mississippi so I could sign stock before the book came out. And um, coming in to the Jackson airport, there was, there was, as they say in the business, an extremely low ceiling. It was horrifying pea soup fog, and there was a 200 foot ceiling, which means it, 200 feet when you're in a plane, <laughs> It's like six feet. I mean, it's it's really really low, and we're coming through clouds. Yeah, we're we're trying to land. Land. and we're suddenly landing. the the pavement is there. Yeah, right. But it wasn't pavement. It was trees. Okay. It was trees. Right. 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 I you wish it was pavement. You wish right. you wish it was a tarmac, um, and and so we're we're coming down. We we come out of the the fog, and I'm thinking. Oh my God, those are trees. And the, and the plane itself starts to say, caution, terrain, caution, terrain. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and right. not in the headphones, yeah. like the plane is saying it. Yeah. Yes. And we pull up. And I'm we, and we, we're like, Carl, did you hear that? Carl. <laughs> right. Sweetheart, <laughs> caution. Ca you know, those aren't two words I've ever heard right next to each other. <laughs> wow. But my first thought was, oh, that's a good, that's a good story. <laughs> right? My first like, split second thought was, damn, those are trees. Second thought was, oh, this, okay, I'm not dead. So this is good. This is interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. and, and, and this is all in my brain. Like I'm thinking, well, I can't write about Carl and flying because I've already done that. Yes. So could I use this in fiction? And wouldn't that be interesting? You land and then the wife won't get back on the plane. And, you know, I'm immediately spinning out. What does this mean? Like they would have a fight. He would say it's nothing, which is what Carl said. It's nothing. We were never in any danger. <laughs> what if a different kind of wife was on the plane? That's that's what it's like. Is it like that? Do you have those moments? I would say, see, you see, you, you've totally, you, in, you, you've, uh, regardless of what you said earlier in our conversation, it turns out you would be on the Titanic with me taking notes. You wouldn't, you would be, wait, wait, hold, keep the boat for one more second. I have to, I have to finish writing this down before I forget. You would totally be that way. Yeah. Yes. So do you have, but, but that's, that is different from writing, but yeah. do you have those moments where something just happens and you think, Oh, that's this is great. That's good. And sometimes it's, it's it's not stirred by, sometimes it's some weird connection to what's just happened, right? You know, you, you, whatever, an apple falls from a tree and I'm like, oh, great. And, and I come up with the Eiffel Tower would be, you know, what a great, you know, a guy jumps out of the Eiffel Tower. I, you know, I don't know. Like the connection is not always obvious. Right. But, but right. I do, I do find that if I don't write that down within 48 hours, I'm like, what was that thing I was so excited about? And I have no memory. So you do, I think for me, I have to have the discipline of making the transition to writing it down as a potential thing, because otherwise uh, it's gone. See, now the thing with me is that I don't write it down yeah. or very rarely because I want a caution terrain to turn into the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. If I write it down as yeah. Jackson, Mississippi coming out of the fog, oh my God, trees. Um, it sticks there, but if I leave it somewhere in the back of my brain where no. I do forget all sorts of things, it then becomes the guy jumping off the Eiffel Tower. Gotcha. So here, here's a question from, from the book of essays. And, and this is across the essays in the book, because as I said, they, you know, they're, they're, they're touching on very, on different topics, different parts of your life. Um, one of the recurring themes is stuff. And there are there is a, a wonderful essay where you you visit uh, friends. The, I think the father has died, as I recall, and you're with yeah. a good friend, and and you're basically looking at the, that that challenge that we as adults have when we lose a parent, and here is this house of stuff, and uh, right. and, and what do you do it? What does it mean? Um, but then separately, 
you have the essay that I, was, I think, an op-ed at one point, because uh, your, your New Year's op-ed about the year of not buying, you know, yeah. where, where the word recurs. And, and your, uh, your good friend, the sister... Um, sister Nina. Thank you. Sister yes. Nina. You know, also weighs in on what stuff means and what it is. But c- could you talk about sort of the topic of stuff and possessions and, and, and objects? Because it's, it's, it's been an important part of your essay writing. It's been an important part of your fiction. Because in a way, it was sort of, a, I feel like, what launched... Uh, the Dutch House, even though Definitely. the Dutch House ended up being something very different as than what you thought it was at the beginning. Uh, but can you sort of talk about talk stuff, about stuff. the modern area and you how you view it? And you know, um, I, I I went to Catholic school for twelve years. I uh, really grew up believing that that the highest calling and every every religion up until a few recent ones um, has has been built on the idea that the less stuff you have, the closer to God you'll be, right? So so poverty, turning away from material possessions is always a prerequisite to finding enlightenment. Siddhartha has to leave the palace in and travel in poverty in order to become the Buddha. You don't become the Buddha sitting in the palace. So, I mean, this is something that has played in my mind my whole life. Now, as I am getting old uh, and and I look at this stuff and I think I've got to organize it, get rid of it, make sure other people won't be burdened by it because friends die, the parents of friends die, you see the burden of stuff. Also, there is that thing where you get to a point in your life where you don't actually want anything else. Right, right. Um, and I can remember when I was a child and I would ask my grandmother, you know, what, what can I get you for your birthday? And she would say, oh, nothing. I really don't want anything. And I always thought she was lying because she didn't want me to spend my money. Now, of course, I realize That's right. nothing, yeah. nothing. Nothing. Take something uh, away. For my birthday, come take something away. That's right. And, you know, when somebody brings me a hostess gift or like, oh, God, please, you know, if I can't eat it or if it's not something that's going to die immediately, I really don't want it. So, so, so much about this book is about the aging process and about dying and about enjoying your life. I mean, I think it's like a feel good book about the fact that we're all going to die. Once you get to the point in your life when you start to embrace, yes, this is going to happen to me too, just like everybody else, um, the days do become so vivid and so beautiful. And truly managing and rearranging your possessions is the most enormous waste of time I can think of. So, yeah, I do focus in on that quite a bit. And you, and you do. It's interesting because there's sort of layers to that are in harmony with each other. In in your year without buying piece essay, where, where you you your New Year's resolution is, I'm just not going to buy stuff this year. I think and I and let me tell you, it's shopping. Yeah. Because there's a big difference between shopping and buying. Okay. Buying is a byproduct of shopping. So it's a year of not shopping, yeah. which means you don't flip through the catalog. Yes. You don't look at the website. You don't yes. zone out looking at the sweaters on J. Crew. And what one of the th- observations you make is it's like pushing back this big ac- hazy activity that we all d- dedicate too much time to, and which has got concerns and anxieties and desires all built into it. And right. you push that back. What it really does is open up space in your life to have a different to to prioritize different things to have bring other things into the foreground, whether it's it's relationships or memories or whatever it is. And, and, and that seems to be a recurring theme in your work, too. Much as you said earlier that a big part of writing is that writing is just an exercise that pushes back the world so that you can think for a moment, you know, Um, and and so uh, I think that's very interesting, but that's very astute. That's I've not made that connection, but that's really interesting and very true. Thank you. Thank (laughs) you. But the, uh, you know, the the irony, the uh, uh, paradox, the paradox is a better term is that on the one and I, and I, I, I have huge admiration and respect for, for your willingness to do it beyond my capacity so far, because I, but I guess I, I understand the desire of it. And by the way, your backdrop 
was perfect for your description of it, mm -hmm. where you, you know, with the Asian, you know. Right, uh, the, it's very you, zen. Yeah, very, very zen. zen. Mm -hmm. um, but paradoxically, you also, in the essays, uh, know when to highlight an object and the importance of an object. So on the one hand, we, we, I'm in total agreement with you, sort of the proliferation of objects and the desire to accumulate objects and, and to hold them over long periods of time is, is, is an interference in sort of contentment, wisdom, life itself. But on the other hand, you, you also will point out that, that there are these objects that can kind of gain in power over time. That's an aspect of you know, storytelling too, right? The typewriter, for instance, in yeah. you, your story, you have this beautiful sort of story of, of typewriters generally and one typewriter in specific and the role that it can play. Um, but can you, so can you talk about that paradox? Like when, when, when the object can really yeah. become a sort of an active component in life as opposed to an impediment too. Right. And, and I'm going to tell a story about that typewriter because mm -hmm. that also talks a lot about how of just a regular part of life can then turn into an essay. So in the essay, How to Practice, which really begins with my the death of Kent Cathcart, who was the father of my childhood best friend, Tavia. And, and I had known Kent since I was seven. I grew up in their house, you know, with very, very close families. Going through his stuff, looking at my stuff, deciding, we talked about moving so that we could go through all our stuff. Then I was like, okay, we don't have to move. I'll just go through all the stuff. Took months. All this time, I'm not thinking of it in terms of an essay. I'm not, this is not like I am setting out on this project in order to write. Getting rid of all of these things, thinking about my own personality and how weird it was that I wanted Waterford Crystal brandy snifters when I was 16. It's weird. Uh, and, and it wasn't until my sister's friend, Megan, comes into town with her daughter, Charlotte. They come over to say hello. I'm showing them the house. And Charlotte, who is eight or nine, I don't remember how old Charlotte is at this moment, um, sees the typewriter in my office and has a meltdown because what she wants is a typewriter. Yeah. And, and at that moment, I thought, oh, this is an essay, yeah. right? Because what it is... I realize, I mean, I've got a cheap electric brother in my office that I use to type up envelopes, but I have two kind of sacred typewriters, manuals that are in the closet that through the cleaning, I never thought about getting rid of them. But this idea of, okay, I have something that is a sacred object to me. I love my Hermes 3000, but here's Charlotte and she's a kid and she wants a manual typewriter. And yeah. they can't find a good one where the keys don't stick. I've got one. I haven't touched it in 25 years. Can I just give this to Charlotte? Even though it was my typewriter through graduate school, it was the typewriter that I wrote all of my stories on in Iowa. Who cares? It's nothing unless it has use. Yeah. That's extremely parochial of me, I know. Uh, and then when I tell Carl, we're talking that night, I say to Megan, you know, don't tell Charlotte this now, but I need to think about it. I think I want to give her my typewriter. I tell this to Carl and Carl was like, oh, well, you know, I have a manual typewriter too, because you bought me one when we were first dating, because you wanted me to be a guy with a typewriter. Oh my God. So now I realize there is an electric and three manuals yeah. in the house and we end up giving Carl's manual, which had never once been used right. to Charlotte, who right. now wants to be a writer. See, you know, it's, right. so, she had that moment of acknowledgement, and now she's like, I want to be a writer. And she types me little notes and sends them to me. I love it. And so as I say, this is the way in which an object can be elevated or somehow can transfer some sort of, the spark of life can be transferred through an object too, and sort of with this weird way on occasion. It's really true. And another thing that I think about, I wonder if you think about this too. It's very easy for me to give things away and get rid of them and be, be kind of easy and loose about my objects because I have writing, because yeah. I have books. Yeah. And I put my history, my Madame Dufarge self goes into the books. 
They're like diaries, even if they're not true. I can read a book I wrote in 1992 and I can remember who I was then, where I was then. But I think that for other people, that investment of self so often goes into the object. So when they think about, I want to give this to my children, I want this to be passed down to my grandchildren, it's like the Ark of the Covenant. It's right. it's the self is in the object. For me, the self is in the books. Yeah, that's very interesting. So w one of the, uh, let, let me say before I ask this question, for those of you listening, the book is filled with life and we'll come back to that. Uh, later in this conversation, but it is also very much a book of essays with a recurring visit to mortality, if you want to put it that way. There, yeah. are, right. there are multiple hospital beds, uh, you know, that are visited. Uh, there are last moments described and by family members, friends, family members, and, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, Suki, who you mentioned, and the, the, which is really, I guess, the longest essay in the piece is this relationship that you stumbled into and was amazing for you and, and, and that, you know, sadly ended in, in the loss of, of Suki's life. And that's kind of where it all kind of happened. So can you talk about, before we talk about, let's say Suki necessarily, but, or you can, if you want, but the, 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 what is it about, maybe it's just our age, right? But the, the, what is it about sort of, how are you thinking about mortality and, and how are you, how is this investigation of, of mortality and these through these different stories? Uh, how has it come about? How has it shaped your thinking? You know, I remember I wrote Truth and Beauty when my best friend Lucy Greeley died when we were both 39. And it was so shocking. It was so, so shocking. Uh, I had to write about it. And now it's not shocking at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's, it is just like, we're all on the same journey, absolutely the same. No matter how much money you have, no matter, no matter what the, the benefit of your life is, we're gonna die. And, and to one, try to find peace and comfort with that. And two, to use it as a sort of thing that you press up against in order to see what's so beautiful in your life, um, to remain in the joie de vivre room, as as they say. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's it's a place that I have always been very comfortable. And I think that that's largely because of my friendship with Lucy and the years that she was so sick and I would go and take care of her in the hospital, but taking care of my grandmother for years through her death, taking care of my father for years through his death. And, and I always say, you know, I would last like five minutes in a Montessori school. I'm not good with little kids. They make me very, very nervous. For a lot of people, death and illness makes them very, very nervous, I'm very comfortable there. And so it's a place oddly that I find myself going because I can do it and other people can't. And we should all just play to our strengths in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's not like a virtue or anything. I mean, again, I'm not good with children. There are tons of things I'm not good with. And there goes our host. Wait, no, he's back. Drop my question. Drop my question. <laughs> um, but I think, all right, so, and, and, and also I'm sure that a lot of that has to do with the 27 years I've spent with Carl and having him come home every night and tell me who died right? and, and how did they die? And was it a good death or was it a bad death? You know, I start, I've stopped a long time ago thinking, oh, death, you know, that's this terrible enemy to thinking, is it a good death, you know, or is it a bad death? It's well, and as I say, and we we talk about this, the conclusions that you come to through your close uh, study of mortality are 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 very uplifting. And and, and this book, Culture Fiction Essay, essays is very uplifting, um, even though it 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 returns a couple of times to this this topic. Uh, one of the paradoxes in in some of your work are, is uh, is. I'm thinking about the, the one of the open. The, I think it's the opening essays, the essay about your three fathers, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, and this you know this great moment that you've talked about publicly, which is I'm gonna, this is this is a photograph of of you yeah. and your and your three different fathers, who are all together. Uh, you know, at, for as a, as a, here it's a wedding. It's My a wedding. sister's wedding. And yeah. Sister's wedding. And and the you know the you have told the story that you know or I'll let you tell it. But but the paradox I wanted to get to, but you can tell us about the story is, is that uh, this is a beautiful essay and hilarious too celebration of the lives of these three men they're differing their differing personalities the impact they've had on your life kind of mm -hmm. what they have given you both as a person and a writer you know it's this beautiful sort of portrayal which you did not share i guess until they had all passed away right so, yeah. so you know so the paradox being you know on the on the one hand there is this sort of celebration of the lives they've led, but on the other hand, it's kind of their passing that that brings it about and allows at least us to to share in it with you, right? Um, but so, t but tell us about that photograph and uh, and 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 why it's the front front piece of this in that way of this book. Yeah. So um, my sister and I both got married in two thousand and five. Got married like six weeks apart. And um, Carl and I didn't have a wedding and Heather and Bill had a really great wedding. And I realized at some point that all three of my mother's husbands were going to be in attendance of my sister's wedding. And I say in the books, it was, it's the family equivalent of a total solar eclipse. <laughs> it's like, this isn't gonna happen again. This is gonna happen exactly once. And I wanted documentation. I wanted a picture and I called all three of them in advance, talked it over with them, made sure they were okay with it. They all said, yes, you know, it wasn't like, I wasn't going to spring this on anybody, but I knew what I was doing. I mean, I knew that at some point I would write about them and that I would want that picture. And <laughs> the funny thing was while they were setting up the picture and there was one that was just the three of them and one that was the three of them with me and one that was the three of them with me and my sister. Um, but the one that was just the three of them, my stepfather, Mike, who was the person, the father that I spent the most years of my life with by far. Um, he said to my dad and to Daryl, my mother's husband, uh, you know what she's doing, don't you? And they said, what? And he said, she's going to take this, have this picture taken. She's going to wait till the three of us are dead. And then she's going to write a really long essay about us. And this is going to be the illustration for the piece. And that was the truth. Like he, he knew me. And one thing that was so fascinating in this story was I wrote this essay, which oddly, I, I wrote it one because my friend Katie Camello's father died. And she said she wanted to write about him. And I said, oh, I've been wanting to write this essay about my three fathers for years and years. I just, you know, like haven't been able to get up the steam to do it, but we'll do it together. You write about your dad. I'll write about my dad's. So there was that. I was supposed to give the Eudora Welty lecture. And so I, this was my Eudora Welty lecture, which ended up getting messed up because of COVID. But I sold the piece to the New Yorker and sent them the photograph. And the two days was probably 48 hours before it was gonna run. They sent me the final proof of the piece and they had taken the photograph out oh. and they had replaced it with this unbelievably cruel cartoony caricature of the picture. And I said, what are you doing? And the editor said, yeah, the art department said that the photo wasn't a high enough resolution to use it in the magazine. And so we're going to use this illustration instead. And I said, as God is my witness. And this was the first piece I had ever sold to the New Yorker. I said, I'll pull it. Yeah. I, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I have a, I have, I got a bookstore full of genius young people who could turn this photograph into a very acceptable piece of art for a magazine, just figure it out. And mm -hmm. they did. Um, and everybody who wrote in said, oh, my God, that picture, that picture. But the picture, that's so interesting when a photograph, when an actual object is such a part of the story. So then from there, I went on 
and told the story of my mother's three husbands. And um, it's a very fairy tale kind of thing because, you know, there are always three visitors and the three visitors, if it's Sleeping Beauty and the three fairies, or if it's the Magi bringing three gifts to the Christ child, you know, it's, or yeah. the three fathers coming, coming to visit Ann Patchett. Yeah. In the Witches in Macbeth, I think, right? This is oh, right. It's, yeah, right. Of course. Everything is three. Yeah. Well, it's, it, and as I say, it's, it's, it's hilarious because the different, there are different personalities and how they interact with you and your writing is, is really one of the pleasures of that tale. As long as we're talking about that photograph and you're, and you're, you're, you're reaching out to the New Yorker and knocking sense into them. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is an essay in here about cover art, right? And and so and the and and many of you watching don't realize this, but but uh, some authors have never asked about the cover of their book. You know, it just sort of happens to them. Or I mean, I've heard horror stories in that regard. Uh, and and, I, and I, I, we both have been in, in the position where we've had a, been able to weigh in and uh, and and hopefully stop mistakes. But your involvement has become even more active in a great way. Because so talk, talk about the, the Dutch house cover and the cover of these precious days. Yeah. Um, yes. It's, it's not just about stopping mistakes. It's, it is about getting out in front and figuring out what I want yeah. and communicating that clearly really early on. And, and my analogy is it's like your birthday, you know, when, when your beloved says, what do you want for your birthday? And you say, oh, you know, I don't want anything. And then they don't get you anything. And then your feelings get hurt. You know, like you have to figure out and be honest about what you want. So I have been involved with the covers of my book for a long time. With the Dutch house, I had a friend paint a portrait of the character of Maeve. And there is a painting of Maeve in the novel so the idea is this painting is the painting in the novel. Uh, one of, and I know so much more about all of this owning a bookstore, but one of the things that you virtually never see on the cover of a book is the direct gaze of a woman. A woman's face is averted. It's, uh, you see her back, it's covered by a hat, it's covered by her hair. She's looking over to the side. And the idea is that women read these novels and they want to be able to imagine themselves as the heroine. And that if we are, if we can't imagine ourselves as the heroine, we are so stupid and fragile that we won't be able to connect with the character. So I wanted this child, this young woman on the cover of the book, having an absolute direct gaze at the reader which frankly, I think is why the book did so well, was that cover is so amazing and it's so rare. It just doesn't happen. And it hangs in your living room. It does. I've, I've been photographed in front of that painting. I love that painting. <laughs> That's right. It's a fabulous painting. And my friend Noah Satterstrom, who lives here in Nashville, did it in four days. Uh, when, I, when I told Harper what I wanted, they said, That's great, but we're going to make a list of artists and get sample sketches from them. And I got off the phone and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do this myself. And I commissioned the painting and it's fabulous. And, and uh, this goes back, this cycles back to what we we're talking about earlier in terms of objects, because the, in the Dutch house, you know, which is such a great story and the, 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 your novel, the painting is one of these objects with sort of an elevated sense right. of, of history, importance, connection, and, and its destiny is somehow wrapped up in the destiny of the family and the characters. And so, you know, at that, I, can, I can imagine being as an author and saying, well, you know, I don't want it to ever be, you could have some authors say, and therefore I never want it to be seen, you know. But I love the fact that it is the front of that book because it yeah. is, it's, it's a part of, it's a very integral part of, of the story. And of course the execution of the painting is so high that it, it, it it doesn't in a way diminish from the pleasure. You're almost, you're excited when you get to the painting in the book and you're like, yes, this is it. And you can kind of go back and forth as the painting kind of plays through the narrative. But anyway, so I thought I'm also, in this conversation that we're having about stuff, when, when Danny and Maeve are thrown out of the house and they lose everything, yeah. the, the thing that really just digs away at Danny is that they forgot to take Maeve's portrait. Mm -hmm. 
because it's like they've left her in a hostile environment by leaving the painting behind. So yeah, it's like, oh, I can be free of stuff, but damn it, I want my painting. And that's a story where you're, you're, where the, the siblings are losing thousands of things, right? You know, it's, it's all right. about the things, you know, being sort of the, whatever in that way that sort of generationally that can happen where, you know, you lose a, a house and the furniture and the silver and everything else along with the person, you know, let's say. Exactly. You know, but, exactly. Uh, and finally, it's this last thing that you're like, that's the thing, you know, that, that, uh, that we care about. And I want. Um, it's just one thing too many. I was talking to a friend of mine recently whose mother had been dead for, I think, 30 years. And she was closing the family estate. She wanted to get this one necklace back from another family member. She fought. There were lawyers involved. And I, and I said to her, your mom's not there. Your mom's not in that necklace. And, and if you get that necklace, you're not going to feel any better but, but somehow wanting it and trying to get it back kept this idea alive of if only I could get the necklace back, but it doesn't yeah. make any difference. No, so yeah, you're not work. getting what you want. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, and that, actually that's a nice segue into the other side of the morality conversation that we were having a second ago, because one of the recurring motifs in, across the essays is the presence of light. And, and in particularly in the final moments of some of the essays or in the final moments of some of the lives of the people that you're describing for us, family members, friends, Suki, is, is this sort of a recognition of how, and sometimes it's just the light in the room, you know, but, but it is, it is, I think it is over the course of the essays, there is a growing sense in it of, of, the, of the light that is in life and that we can be exposed to and we can connect with and that we can add to. Can you, can you talk about that at all? I mean, yeah, it's on the edge of mysticality perhaps, but, but, but nonetheless, it's clearly an important part of, of this group of, of essays. When I finished the book and had it all put together and had thrown essays out and written new essays and got it all assembled and read it through, I thought, oh, there's too much light. There's too much light. There are too many references to light especially at the end of things. And I looked so hard and I couldn't take any of them out because they were all so true. I mean, I think about the essay, There Are No Children Here, and it ends with my friend Robin Price Glasser, who is the illustrator for Fancy Nancy and for the children's books I've written. And being with her in front of huge groups of tiny children and the light there is just no other word for it. The light she pours out on those children is so amazing. And it is the embodiment of love. Yeah, I, there was no other word. Yeah. Uh, you, you say, uh, we're going to know. Do you anymore. We should stop soon. Okay, well, let's wrap it up in a second here. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm loving this. I can do this forever, but. I, you I, know, I kind of, one of the questions I, I asked myself, well, I asked you, but it's connected to what you're talking about, I think, is, is, is what's the moral center of this group of essays? Is there a moral center? Is there, there's many discoveries over the course of them that, that the reader will have for sure. And, and, and some that, you know, they will want to adopt or that will be an insight into their, their own lives and their own families and their own relationship to things and, and everything else. Do you think there's a moral center though, you know, in any way? And I guess, but well, here's my pitch for it. You know, I, I don't, really, don't want to put you pitch. I, That's the kind of question that I'm like, you should have emailed me last night. I, know, I, I have there. to come up with a moral center. That okay, was well, not what do you think? And I'll tell you. So, because it's related to the light thing. And and uh, and, I, and I, I do want us to, to talk about, about the Suki essay. But I guess this maybe it's from the end of your introduction, where you say that in, in the course of this life that we lead, that the trick is to find the joy in the interim and make good use of the days we have. Yeah. And it seems like that that is, I mean, as they say, you know, there's something that that is, at, at the, even though that's not discussed across the essays, is this sort of this cumulative feeling of that, particularly as we meet friends of yours who are gone or your fa- your parents, your fathers who are gone, and, and we have a sense of what they gave you, right? And is that it, it accumulates towards neither, uh, you know, and certainly not bitterness or a deep sense of loss. It, it, it's, it's, it's somehow uh, more hopeful. There is this sort of this, this sort of glimpse uh, that's tied to the light of, uh, of how can we live our lives in a way that, that has more meaning 
and that and how do these events help us come to that point? I mean, that does seem to be a recurring part of what, what you're working through here. Yeah, and again, I think that that's the very, the very tenet of, of Buddhism. Um, we will suffer. There is suffering in the world around us, and we will suffer. We numb ourselves out. We block suffering through accumulation. Um, and if it's looking at the internet or buying sweaters or, or however you zone out, I think this is somehow a quest to not zone out and that the key to not zoning out is to acknowledge suffering and to acknowledge what we are doing in order to avoid it, to avoid the fears of death uh, or, you know, we, we fill our life with a ton of busy work. We become hamsters on our wheels and if we could just say, yeah, this is coming, this is here and it's coming for those that we love and it's coming for me as well. And I'm gonna sit with it and try my best to be okay with it, to acknowledge it. Then the, the noise falls away much more easily. That's what I'm shooting for. What you're talking about is, is succinctly put in the title of the collection and the title essay, which is These Precious Days, right? That's, I feel, the, the sentiment behind those three words is the reminder that the days we're in are the precious days. And how do we get to them? You know, knowing that we're gonna run out of them, we're gonna run out of them not only in our own sense, but the people that we love, we're gonna run, they may run out of it first. And we're, you know, that precious, the precious time we have with them is gonna be lost. Uh, you know, before, long before we lose our own time, potentially. And at the centerpiece is this essay, These Precious Days, about uh, this incredible sort of chance relationship that you had with, with Suki. And so can you can you talk about sort of that crazy sort of setup of, of how you met together and how that kind of led to this sort of range of revelation for you? Well, so I met Suki for a few minutes backstage in a theater in Washington, DC. I was interviewing Tom Hanks. Sookie worked for Tom. She was his assistant. I've had the experience a few times in my life of meeting somebody and just thinking, oh, it's you, you know? Which is really funny because the person I'm meeting is Tom Hanks, but the person that I'm kind of locking eyes with is his assistant. And I just keep thinking, who is she? I mean, there's a line in which I say, how famous would you have to be to get someone like that to be your assistant? And uh, Tom was interested in uh, maybe opening a bookstore. We communicated back and forth. Sookie facilitates communication. She and I communicate a little bit on email. Emails being very, you know, it's a very affectionate, familiar mode of communication. Um, we sign our emails with love and then with much love and uh, and then it turns out that she has pancreatic cancer. At one point, she says to me, I'm sorry, I haven't answered your email in such a long time. I've been out of the office for a health concern. And I and I said something like, you know, I hope I hope you were having plastic surgery. I, <laughs> I hope you were getting your eyes done. Tell me it's that. And she said, no, I you know, I had pancreatic cancer. I cancer. I had a Whipple procedure. Then she goes into remission. Then she comes out of remission. She has a reoccurrence. She's trying to get into a clinical trial. Carl ends up getting her into a clinical trial here in Nashville. She's going to come for a couple of weeks because then that same trial is going to open up at UCLA. She comes out here. The pandemic hits. She can't go home. The trial at UCLA is canceled, but she's already in the trial here so she can keep going. So literally, if she leaves her house, she's going to die, yeah. right? Like. Her, her only chance is to stay. She has been unbelievably busy her whole life. The job with Tom has been really interesting, but all encompassing and all around the world and all hours of the day or night. And what she really wants to do is paint. So she's in our house. We're in our house. I'm not traveling anymore. Carl isn't going into work. We three adults are here together and she is painting like crazy. I'm upstairs writing, she's downstairs painting, and, and we, 
wind up having this beautiful life. I mean, truly, I had never seen her other than 10 minutes. I like when she got here, I didn't exactly remember what she looked like when I was picking her up at the airport. And then she lived with us. And it, in a lot of ways, it's about just being open to the possibility of life. And there are, for every one time I'm open to it, there are a thousand times I am not and I pass by. And I don't say to someone, hey, come live with us. Come live with us and let's see how that goes, right? Yeah. I will help. I will give you my all. But for whatever reason, this time I did. And I knew what I was getting into. Carl knew there are some people who get through pancreatic cancer. There are not some people who get through recurrent pancreatic cancer. I knew, I knew how this story was going to end as much as I was present and with her believed that it could go another way. I know where I was signing on. Um, but again, that's something that I'm capable of. And it was just an enormous privilege and joy to it's spend neat. that time. It was a gift. I mean, it, it, sure, it, comes across, it sure comes across that way. And and one thing that, that is a really nice memory is that you met Sookie. You it's were nice. like the last house guest before the world shut down. Shut down. Yeah. yeah. So the four of us had dinner and, and she I was photographed with her in front of, of the of the Dutch house paint. Right. And, and by the way, you know, th so this is, uh, you know, again, this is, where, where is it? There you are. That's one of the paintings that Suki did while she was uh, with you, right? Oh, and that, that's Sparky. Dog. Sparky the dog. Sparky yeah. the dog. And there's another painting of hers on the back of the book because we couldn't mm -hmm. decide which one to use. Mm -hmm. And Suki was there through all the meetings on Zoom with the art department at HarperCollins picking the background colors, picking the spine design. She was so involved, you know, at her very sickest. And she's got to see the final cover. She didn't get to see the final book, but she got to see the final cover. And that was fantastic. Well, you know, I, I, we won't, I don't want to give away for, for readers who have not had a chance to meet Suki, but she is an extraordinary person <laughs> so yeah. in terms of what has happened in her life, in terms of how she relates to her experience in the present. Um, so that's, uh, you know, part of that's It's an incredible portrayal of a person that we all wish that we could have sort of stumbled into the company with. And, and also, I will say, having uh, written the book about my friend Lucy after she died, so many people said to me, what would have happened, do you think, if you had written that book when she was still alive? And and that's always stuck with me. And writing about Suki and being able to hand it to her and say, what do you think? You know, tell me how you would make this different. Yeah. And when I wrote it, when I told her I was going to write it, I said, this is just for the two of us. No one else has to read it. And if you read it and you want other people to read it, we'll take it from there. And she read it. And it was such a portrait of her. She didn't see herself that way. She started giving it to her friends, to her family. And people were saying, yeah, that's exactly who you are. That's how we see you too. And then she did want it to be published. It was published in Harper's Magazine. It went around the world like three times. And people from her past appeared, people who were interested in her art, people who wanted to support her through her cancer, just like this tsunami of love from everywhere. The, there was a moment right before she died and I was sitting on her couch in Los Angeles and I got an email from a woman and it came from Harper's Magazine. They sent it to me and she said, my ex-husband was one of the guys who was on that tall ship, the Christmas that Sookie got on when she was in her 20s. And he wants to, to send her a note. And he did. Amazing. Amazing. It was incredible. That's a beautiful, because I, that's a beautiful, in a way, the book ending because you open the essays with this essay about your fathers, which you specifically wrote after they were gone. Yeah. And which they did not get to read, you know, and then, but to end it then virtually end your, your, the collection with this essay that you actually opted to do the, the reverse. Right. And I'm sure, you know, to, you would have regretted it otherwise. I mean, uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm glad that you did that. We got to speak about one more hero before we go. 
Okay. And the last hero is, of course, Carl, right? I thought you were going to say Snoopy. That's so funny. Okay. Carl, better choice. Yes, Carl. Carl, you know, you say, you know, humorously, I think at some point that he's the perfect guy to be on a, on a, on a uh, desert island with because uh, because he can fly a plane, sail a boat. He's a, 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 your appendix. a yeah. physician and, and, and a good conversationalist too, right? Isn't that right. Terrible? And by the way, I would I would absolutely happily be on a desert island with Carl. And don't tell my wife I said that, you know. <laughs> but I think you're right about you're right. Carl is the one you want to be on the desert island. More than you, yeah, more than you, and you and I would just talk and starve to death, is what would happen. Right. If we were there. <laughs> and you know what's, what's so weird? Carl also has a degree in agricultural and animal husbandry from the University of Mississippi, which he got before he went to med medical school. So, oh, yeah, of course, he does. He's covered, right? But, so, I, but it is one of the lovely things about this collection of essays that he's the recurring character, you know, yeah. like, like in a serial television series where you have that one person who keeps popping up on occasion and, and, you know, but, but he is, uh, it, it, that's a lovely part of the, of the piece too. Yeah. Um, and and I've, had, I've had people say to me, Oh, this is a book about how much you love your husband, yeah. which, um, it, that's a really terrific outcome. Also a friend of mine said you could, you could do like a greatest hits, where you could just take all of the Carl essays from all the different things you've written over the years and just have a book called Carl, oh. you know, the greatest hits. Um, yeah, Carl, Carl is, is very much the hero of the story because he is someone who always says yes. You know, when I said, oh, I, I met this woman who wants to open a bookstore. Would you mind if I just paid all this money and opened a bookstore? How would you feel about that? Oh, great, you know, what a fantastic idea. No matter what I say to this guy, he says, that is amazing. I'm behind you all the way. That's exactly what you should do. I'm so proud of you. And uh, that's a nice way to live. Well, to Carl. To Carl. Ann Patchett, it's been a pleasure seeing you, talking with you, reading your work. It's been a pleasure. I'm so grateful that you've taken time out from being the best-selling book in the country to having this conversation. I would also like to say that there is a spider. There is such a spider. It's waving its little arms at me right now, crawling back and forth across my computer screen. So it'll be nice to wrap this up and take the little fella outside. For your own safety. For your own, we're going to bring this to conclusion for your own safety. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining Thank us. So Thanks, Ian, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.